been invited to give a, a guest lecture on privacy preserving smart contract architectures. Um, so as with who I am, I am uh, the CEO of uh, Aspect of Privacy Preserving um, Technology Company, where uh, our focus is on enabling uh, privacy preserving transactions uh, on public ledgers. Um, and I'm one of the uh, co authors of the PEC ZK SNARK. So, um, the goal of this lecture is to um, effectively describe how to construct privacy preserving uh, blockchain architectures. Um, so, uh, I'm going to assume that uh, folks have some familiarity with blockchains in general, with how smart contracts work, with how the things like the, the Ethereum protocol works, as well as some basic understanding of ZK proofs. Uh, and what we're going to describe is um, how do you actually construct some kind of smart contract abstraction where you have private state as a first class primitive. Um, so imagine your Ethereum style, Solidity style contract, um, but where you can actually genuinely just have private state, where under the hood what's going to be happening is that state will be represented on a blockchain uh, in, a, in encrypted form, and any state transitions will be um, validated through the use of zero knowledge proofs. So um, the end goal will be to produce end to end encrypted transactions. Uh, without you know trusted hardware or trusted the third parties will do this with just pure maths um, and uh, we want to try and preserve traditional smart contract semantics uh, and so the way that one um, pr programs smart contracts for this ledger and transacts with the, the network um, uh, represented by uh, this distributed ledger should be um, familiar to non cryptographers. So this is um, something that my company is, is focusing uh, very greatly on uh, lately. Uh, so this is what we're trying to build with this um, ASIC 3 architecture, um, which is um, building on top of um, some of some of our existing protocols we've built, such as ASIC Connect. But really, this this um, uh, uh, research in this kind of area obviously goes back multiple decades. When it comes specifically to things like privacy preserving transactions, the zero coin paper, the cash they were. Um, considerable pioneers, as well as uh, Zexi was the first paper to describe um, uh, like private computation, proofs of private computation um, uh, using um, concepts that will be exploring in this talk, such as recursive proof composition. Um, and this has also been tackled by Mino Protocol. Um, I imagine there are, there are several others as well, but um, I'm uh, either forget, uh, I've forgotten um, to mention or uh, am unaware of, but there's, there's a long history of um, existing work that we're building up here. So to start with, um, we need to, we need a proof system. So um, when we're talking about uh, smart contract architectures, where proofs transactions um, to a, to a blockchain network are going to be constructed um, locally by transaction senders by users, uh, that uh, we have to we can make some assumptions here that the the prover is going to be um, running some relatively wimpy hardware. So the proof that we're going to have a very low computational complexity prover. Um, uh, so, be running in commodity hardware, they might be interacting, interfacing with an with a, a application in the web browser, so they may be running in the, the proof, may be running in web assembly. Um, we're going to need arbitrary depth of test proof composition for reasons that will become clear in a minute, um, and therefore, we're going to need some, um, uh, we're going to need small proof sizes so that the recursive prover is um, relatively efficient because we have a very weak prover. Um, and so, uh, the, the overall architecture that we're going to be describing in this in the lecture, um, the intention is that, we, that this will be built with um, uh, basically a plonkish style adamantization using his succinct case of the improvement schemes, where the interactive horizontal proof is going to be a uh, subject protocol. Uh, things like Hyperplonk, um, or we currently assume to publish a paper with Plonk, which is going to be building up with this. But this is something of an of a implementation detail. Uh, the actual proofing system used for this architecture um, is not um, particularly important other than it needs to be very free or efficient and it needs to be able to support very high, uh, it needs to support arbitrary depth recursion where the recursive proofer is very performant. Um, so yes, uh, to start with, what is a blockchain? Well, um, the reason I put the slide here is because uh, what I want to really get at is that at its core, a blockchain is just a state machine. Um, you have um, a current value value of the state machine. You send a transaction um, that updates the state according to some formal rules uh, to get a new um, uh, um, uh, state. Um, 
as for how this is achieved using consensus mechanisms, um, things like that, that's kind of um, not important for the context of this talk. Um, uh, all we want to do is make, make those state transitions private and, and verifiable. Um, and so maybe this is a more interesting question to ask, what is a private state machine? Um, uh, because um, it is not sufficient to uh, simply encrypt um, an existing public distributed ledger. So you take Ethereum, um, you could encrypt the, 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 the Markov partition tree that Ethereum uses to represent state. Um, and then use ZK-SNARK proofs or ZK-SNARK proofs to prove the correctness of state transitions. But this will not be sufficient for meaningful privacy because um, you, don't just have to, you, you don't just have to encrypt your state tree uh, uh, if you want um, privacy on a blockchain ledger. Uh, but you also need to ensure that the act of modifying and deleting the encrypted state does not leak information. Um, to give an example, imagine uh, I have an encrypted um, uh, version of Ethereum, of the Ethereum ledger, and I send somebody, and I send, I start sending multiple Ethereum transfers to, to various people. Even if my balance is encrypted, the fact the act of me changing my encrypted balance multiple times leaks information about the Ethereum ledger as well. Um, and so uh, we must be ca very careful about um, what we mean by what is a private state machine. Um, and about choosing the representation of, uh, of data um, within a private blockchain. Uh, and so the way that we do this, it's basically that it's, it's, it's very, very similar to the description in the zero code paper, how Zcash works, except that it's um, much more, um, the, uh, we have a much more relaxed kind of um, view of what we mean by state. We, we're leaving it very abstract. But the idea is that you want some kind of key value database um, that you're going to represent your, your change data um, that we're going to encode as a Merkle tree. And uh, that Merkle tree needs to be append only. The idea is if modifying or deleting an entry in your database leaks information, then the only thing you can do is add new leaves to your, to your database, um, which is very restrictive uh, because how does one uh, modify state once it's created, and this is something that you need to do if you want to create smart contracts, if you want to actually program um, digital currencies, money, business logic inside, inside, a, inside a, some kind of distributed ledger, you need to be able to modify state. Uh, and so this is where we're, we're using the um, relatively canonical abstraction of a appended number between a number of um, So this is kind of by default how you handle that state. Uh, it's, um, the idea is that um, if I want to add something to a database, I encrypt um, some, some data with, my, with a secret key. Uh, and then if I want to delete um, uh, like, uh, some data, if I want to delete a record of the database, I'm going to then kind of re-encrypt my encrypted state um, to form what's called a nullifier. Uh, the idea here being that um, you cannot link a nullifier to a state value, um, to a state entry without um, knowledge of the decryption key. Um, and then I'm going to add that nullifier to a nullifier set. So the idea is if you have an append only um, Merkle tree and a, and a nullifier set, then uh, the, you, can, you can use these abstractions to represent states by considering state to be live if, um, if state exists in the data in, in your Merkle tree but does not exist in your nullifier set. And state is considered dead, deleted if it exists both in the Merkle tree and the nullifier set. Um, this means that private state has a very inherent UTXO structure um, because, uh, you, because um, the only way to modify state is to delete it and then recreate the changed version. This is extremely similar to what the habit works. Um, and by, by um, UTXO, uh, that stands for unspent transaction uh, object. Um, so this is just uh, some toy descriptions here uh, of imagine we have. Uh, you know, we, the data we, we, we have a little string here that we want to store part of the US Constitution. Um, and uh, the, um, so we'll, we'll uh, encrypt it to, to, to form a UTXO, and then as nullified will be the encryption of the UTXO. So the idea is that these two be value. Uh, unless, you own, unless you know the secret key, you can't link these two. Um, and so just to take this one step further, if you want to, imagine you now want to, um, uh, you have some. You have some need to uh, basically. How do you prove? How does one prove that 
um, a, a value exists in the database and that it has not been deleted. Uh, uh, you use it um, uh, as zero knowledge circuit. So it's a zero knowledge proof. The idea is you have a zero knowledge circuit where you will uh, effectively decrypt an nullify um, uh, and prove that it, uh, it came from the UTXO. Uh, but the uh, the actual one, um, the secret key, um, uh, and the actual, and the UTXO in question will be uh, private implicitly so and so um, uh, hidden from observers. Um, so if, if one's familiar with things like Zcash, with ZeroCoin, with um, Aztec Connect, or any any um, or, or Toronto Cash, or any of these existing um, private um, uh, Dicky Snark based uh, digital um, protocols, uh, this should be relatively familiar. Um, but there is a question here, which is: Is private UTXO state sufficient um, for the for the purpose of this uh, the original purpose described in this lecture, which is uh, to create a private programmable smart contract network. But can you basically can you recreate the existing universal blockchain applications using UTXO space? Uh, and the answer to that is no, um, you can't. Because uh, you, there's a reason why, um, so, block, so blockchain like Ethereum uh, use a account based um, abstraction um, to represent data. So unlike Bitcoin, where you have these, uh, in Bitcoin, uh, Data is represented using UTXO, so each UTXO has a owner and a value, uh, which represents a cryptocurrency balance. Um, and a user's, the amount of Bitcoin a user owns will be the sum of all UTXOs. In Ethereum, it works differently, where um, users have addresses and you just have a, a key, basically a key value store in your database um, so that uh, um, my Ethereum balance will just be represented as one um, entry in the Ethereum state. The problems with UTXOs. The problems with UTXOs is that you, you get you run into race conditions with them because um, for one, if you consider consider a block of cryptocurrency transactions, so um, you, you have a block with 100 transactions in it, that block is about to be posted on chain. Um, you cannot modify a UTXO twice in the same block because one transact if you if you have two transactions that modify one UTXO, both transactions are going to try to delete that UTXO and then. Um, recreate and create a new UTX so that represents the modify value. And so um, the second transaction in, in the block that tries to do this will fail because the original UTX no longer exists. Um, this is um, more, more, this is not really a problem that can be worked around um, in a private, uh, uh, in a privacy preserving um, architecture because if um, so the way that you would, um, inside a ZK snark system, the way that you would perform state updates is that, um, so let's take a joint split circuit, for example. Um, it's called joint split because the idea is a user combines two UTXOs that they own, they destroy them, and they create two output UTXOs in that place. And the, um, the, the sums of the input UTXOs and the output UTXOs need to balance, but the owners of the output UTXOs can be different, and that's how one can perform a uh, a cryptocurrency transfer using UTXOs. Um, how one would do this in a ZKS knock is I would have to construct multiple proofs that prove the existence um, of the inputs um, in, in a multiple tree. So, you know, I, I, uh, a multiple tree is just a, a hash tree that represents a, a database. So, um, uh, each, the, the way one constructs a multiple tree is the base layer of the tree represents all of your data elements and then you, and then you hash them together um, in pairs to form the next layer of the tree. Those become the nodes, and then those nodes will then be hashed in pairs, uh, and you can you continue hashing up until you reach the, the root of your tree, and that root becomes the that root hash becomes a representation of your database. And so to prove that something exists in a Merkle tree, you just pro you provide the hash path um, that hashes up to the root. And so um, to do a transcript transaction, I would provide these Merkle inclusion proofs for my input UTXOs. I would then construct their nullifiers, um, and then Compute the and then compute the output UTXOs. Uh, however, um, I would also need to uh, prove the non-existence of the nullifiers of the input UTXOs. And so, once my first once that first transaction has been processed and those nullifiers have been created, any subsequent transactions that try to try to construct inclusion proofs for those UTX, input UTXOs will fail because um, they won't be able to construct um, proofs of non-membership in the nullifiers. So this is a fundamental problem with UTXOs, they have race conditions, and so you cannot perform deterministic state updates um, 
uh, sorry, you cannot perform sequential state updates um, within a block using UTXOs. You also have all the ownership requirements about UCA, about in private state, where um, if state's encrypted with an encryption key, then it is implicitly owned by the entity that possesses that encryption key. Uh, and so you cannot have, um, uh, you cannot perform to turn, uh, you cannot update that UTXO state without the encryption key. You cannot have the concept of global state. Um, for example, uh, if, for a, if you're doing some kind of decentralized exchange which needs to know the total volume of various liquidity pools, that's a global variable. It doesn't work with ETXO, it's nothing encrypted. And so the way that we do, we, we're thinking about this is to, to actually create a privacy preserving smart contract architecture, you really need two um, types of state um, in your network. You need UTXO based private state as a, as a like representative as a number three and a by set. But you also need a chunk based model public state um, represented as some form of Merkle Patricia tree, like Ethereum does it. And you need both um, to, to, because uh, any kind of meaningful privacy preserving application is going to require some kind of public state. Um, and so um, internally, we've, we've been calling these hybrid applications, um, ones that yeah, use both public and private state. Uh, and so our conclusion is that for um, relatively like any kind of meaningful privacy preserving smart contract architecture, you need access to both of the both types of state. Um, and so uh, to create a private state machine, um, you really need what you, what, you, what you really need is a hybrid state machine with private and public state, where you have um, rules around how one performs private state transitions um, that are based around. Uh, receiving user users client side unit sensors of data side generated proofs of correctness of private state transition, as well as um, uh, basically instructions to modify public state um, that are um, ordered, and sequenced, and executed by some kind of third party. Uh, so, for example, in Ethereum, um, the public state transitions are um, ordered and executed by validators. Um, uh, so the validator will construct a block, um, uh, and um, then Ethereum nodes will then execute the transactions in the block. Um, this used to be performed by miners back when Ethereum was proof of work, and in layer two, uh, these are generally have performed by sequences. Uh, just to just to clarify what I mean by layer two for the folks who are not familiar, um, a layer two is a uh, minute is basically a blockchain network that um, you inherit. Uh, the uh, consensus mechanism of an, of another um, distributed ledger. So the idea is, for example, you can construct a layer two where um, blocks are generated um, and processed by an Ethereum smart contract. And so that smart contract becomes the ultimate source of record for what the the, the, the state of the layer two chain is. Um, and it uh, means that one does not have to reinvent a consensus mechanism, um, but uh, layer twos can generally Leverage techniques such as zero knowledge proofs to um, provide much faster transaction throughput than a, than a native layer one like Ethereum. Okay, so what I want to talk about now is one second. What I'd like to talk about now is how to create a smart contract abstraction that contains both private and public state. Uh, I'd like to start here because. Um, how we want to represent our smart contract is going to, in turn, kind of affect and influence how we design our wider um, kind of uh, um, uh, architecture for this um, private blockchain that we're building. And in turn, that's going to affect how we design the ZK smart circuits that we're going to be using to encode the logic of this, of this um, uh, architecture. So one thing that we need to consider is the time ordering of state transitions. So um, a user is going to submit. Um, so, so let me just wind back a little bit. Uh, so to summarize, the um, uh, like what what I've been like I've been talking for the last few minutes around private state transitions and public state transitions, but um, that's relatively abstract. So let's try and um, bring it bring it down a level to make it a little bit more uh, coherent. What I mean by this. So um, at its core. Uh, a blockchain um, is, is effectively the ones that exist at the moment, most of them are um, public ledgers. Uh, they're just 
state transition, uh, the state regimes where the um, developers can deploy smart contracts. That where the smart where one specific smart contract will effectively um, control, define the semantics and the rules around um, how state is created and modified and destroyed. That is effectively um, linked to the smart contract. Uh, so if I create an ERC twenty token, for example, on Ethereum, uh, let's say I call it, um, and I call it, I don't know, let's, let's say we're going to make move move coin. Um, uh, on Ethereum, I'm going to create a move coin smart contract um, that will define um, rules around how people can transfer MOOC tokens, um, and uh, this this uh, contract will effectively um, be a um, a blob a blob of um, what's called Ethereum virtual machine code. Uh, so the so um, ledgers like Ethereum, what they will do is instead of defining what what like what kind of instead of the, like Okay, a bit a network like Bitcoin was going to explicitly define um, what a transaction can be. On Bitcoin, you can basically do one thing, and that is transfer Bitcoin around. Uh, but Ethereum things are more generic, where you can construct these smart contracts made of, of Ethereum virtual machine code, where the idea is that the Ethereum virtual machine is an abstract imaginary computer um, with extremely well-defined semantics. So that is very e it's very easy to Code out an emulator of this Ethereum virtual machine. Um, so we do this so that um, programs written um, according to the EVM spec are um, uh, their behavior is explicitly determined by the EVM code, and there's no um, ambiguity about what that contract is supposed to do. So the idea is when you create a contract, that that they, that byte code, EVM byte code, is going to exist as a data block in the Ethereum blockchain, like in in the in the, in the Ethereum chain state, and then as a user, I can then send a transaction to that smart contract. Um, effectively, uh, every Ethereum transaction itself is, is also a small blob of EVM code. And so if I want to, if I, if I want to like, interact with the move point contract and transfer tokens around, um, my transaction is going to be a small blob of EVM code, which basically says, um, uh, effectively what it's going to be doing is it's going to say call the transfer function on, on, the, on the move token contract. Um, and then um, the, and Ethereum that's pressing the transaction will faithfully it'll look up the contract address of the move token, um, it'll grab the bytecode, it'll uh, load the bytecode into the into the EVM ambient simulator, um, and then begin executing that code according to the inputs that, that I've given it with my transaction. And my inputs will be like call the transfer function and say I'll transfer it to my friend Dave and I'm going to transfer 10 tokens. And then um, uh, and then the, the move contract will have some code that represents the transfer function that will kind of execute the the, the, the transfer logic for me. It'll, it'll check that I'm, you know, I can I own that that many tokens. It'll then perform the various, and then it'll perform the various state transitions required to deduct tokens from my balance and increase them on Dave's balance. Um, and so that's what I mean by public state transition: the act of um, executing virtual machine code uh, that governs rules around um, modifying state uh, uh, associated with a smart contract. Private state transitions are similar, however, um, the ordering is different. So for a private state transition, uh, the, the rules of the contract um, are going to be defined as a ZK smart circuit. So um, instead of there being a blob of Ethereum bytecode existing in the chain, in the, in the, in the chain there is instead going to be a, a verification key for a um, so every every private state transition, like basically, if I have a contract, um, let me just actually let me just um, I think this slide is actually going to be a bit more beneficial to describe this. Um, in in the privacy preserving architecture we're thinking of, um, and my prediction is this is going to be quite a natural representation for these kind of hybrid blockchains with public and private state, is that you compose your contract out of public functions and private functions. Where public functions um, act very much like um, existing um, smart contract functions for chains like Ethereum or Solana, uh, like I just described in the previous slide. And private functions will do something slightly different. So private functions will have the ability to update this encrypted UTXO tree, um, update a nullify set, that like nullifies to a nullify set, as well as read from historical public states, but not necessarily current, the current state of the chain. And they'll be able to unilaterally call public functions. So, what are these weird restrictions? Why are they there? Because 
when is when a user interacts with a network with a smart contract like calling and executing a private function, the user has to generate a proof of that function's execution uh, locally on their device, uh, and then they send the proof to the blockchain network. Uh, because of this, there is a certain time ordering um, you have to that has to be obeyed. Because when I'm as a user, when I'm generating a transaction, I don't necessarily know what the latest, like what the, the I don't know what the state of the blockchain is going to be when my transaction is mined. Um, I only know what it is right now in the present. Um, this is why private functions can only be in historical public state. The idea is that um, when you're constructing this proof of function execution, um, one of the public inputs to your proof is going to be the state route that you're using for your state record, and that state route may is allowed to be a historical state. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be the the the, the version of the. It doesn't have to be the state route that exists when the transaction is mined, um, because that's an unreasonable expectation. Because that state route will constantly be changing. Similarly, private functions can call public functions, but only unilaterally without return parameters. This is because. Uh, if I'm constructing a proof of execution for a private function, I can, on the public inputs of my proof, I can, I can add um, instructions to call public functions, uh, but I have no way of, of, of receiving return parameters um, because uh, when you construct your proof of private function execution, you don't know what that public function is going to return. Is that the return value of that public function could be dependent on public, like the values in, of, in the public state tree, which again, I, as a transaction center, I don't know what the current values of the public state are. Uh, so what I'm trying to get at here is that if you have a hybrid system where, where contracts cons consist of public functions and private functions, the private functions are effectively executed before, like all, like all the private function calls in the transaction are executed before the public calls. Because the user is, is constructing the proofs of execution of the private function calls client side, and um, a some kind of like minor or sequence or a validator of the network is going to be the entity that is um, executing the public function calls, which happen like, later on in the in the transactions um, lifecycle. So, just to summarize um, what I mean, like what you can do with the private functions of public functions. So, for a private function, you update the UTXO tree. Um, that represents the state, you can add another bias to another bias here. Um, um, to be kind of pedantic about this, uh, the private, in, in the private function, you don't actually up modify the, the nullifier tree and change the nullifier root. You actually just emit an instruction um, to, a, to the sequencer to add a nullifier to another nullifier set, and then the sequencer will later on um, perform the various multiple inclusion proofs um, and non inclusion proofs to, to, to add that nullifier. Um, Similarly, you can read from a historical public state using an old version of the state route, um, and you can, and that private function can can instruct, can basically can execute function, public function calls without return parameters. Effectively, the, the private function can, can say, um, like, transaction execution is not complete unless a specific public function is, is executed. And public function trees, technically, you can update the UTXO tree with them, um, but given that all the data in this tree is going to be encrypted, you probably don't want to do that because uh, that requires leaking your leaking the, uh, secret keys um, to, 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 a, to a sequencer. Um, similarly, with updated nullifiers, you can do this, but it's public, so you probably don't want to. But the most important thing that a public function can do is it can read and write from a public state. Um, so going back, going off, kind of like climbing up the abstraction layer a little bit. Um, so, so what is a smart contract in the concept of a, a Privacy preserving protocol. Um, it's um, if we're defining functions according to the ZK sign verification keys, then a contract, a smart contract is the set is defined by its set of function verification keys. Um, uh, so the idea is if you hash all these keys together, then you get then that that hash output is going to effectively be um, a unique representation of that contract. Uh, if each ZK snark circuit represents a function, then um, the protocol that's kind of that's processing transactions and therefore kind of processing function calls needs to be able needs to interpret the public inputs of these function circuits according to some kind of uniform API um, application binary interface. And I think we're going to get into 
that right now on the slide. Um, so this is kind of a toy example of what an API will look like. The idea is that um, the protocol will basically define a set of public inputs um, that are going to be used for, that are going to be interpreted according to various um, purposes for the protocol. And so the idea is that if you if you if, if you have a zk snark second arisen as a function that does not conform to these rules, then the behavior of that contract is going to be somewhat defined because the protocol is going to if interpret these public inputs according to this ABI, regardless of the, the intention of the author. So the idea here is in this toy example, like the first 10 public inputs are arguments, like input arguments to the function, and then you have to do things like pass in the state roots of the various data trees that, you're, that, the, that the network is using, things like uh, you have a concept of message sender, which um, for private functions can be, um, uh, well, so the idea is that you probably want to encrypt this, but then inside the private function circuits, you could then um, decrypt it to, to get access to the address of the sender, uh, and then you would reserve some additional public inputs. I don't know this correctly. This should be thirteen to nineteen. Um, uh, additional public inputs uh, to represent kind of um, state like UTA code that, that um, the function wishes wants to add to the to the UTA code tree. Um, instructions to add nullifiers to nullify set, and then potentially parameters to kind of init events like you can with Ethereum smart contracts. So let's, um, to, to try and um, kind of put this all in context, what I've been describing here is a way of representing, um, so we, like a way of representing um, what, like a hybrid smart contract, where you have a smart contract that has public and private state, and, you, and we can define functions that describe the rules around how these, how the states can be modified. However, um, we have one issue here, which is that if one thinks about a, like a regular Ethereum transaction, then one transaction can be composed of multiple function calls going to multiple different contracts. Uh, for example, if I want to trade um, ETH for DAI on the Uniswap uh, smart contract, then I will transact with a Uniswap contract, but then that Uniswap contract is going to make function calls to the to um, to a wrapped Ethereum contract, it's going to make function calls to a Dai contract. It might make function calls to like um, some uh, the price oracle contract. Um, there's going to be lots and lots of different contract calls, and so we need some kind. Of, we need to be able to represent this concept of composability inside this um, private, um, uh, like the, 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 this private state blockchain that we're we're building up, um, where where you can basically execute a sequence of function calls that are going to different contracts. Uh, uh, what I'm basically describing is we need some concept of call semantics. Uh, so how do, you, how do you do that? Okay, so this is where current focus can come into the picture. So what I've been describing so far is how to construct not circuits that represent kind of function exceptions to contracts. But we also need some other, some way of um, allowing our blockchain protocol, our layer two protocol, to validate the correctness of a function call. Um, and we're going to need to do this in a privacy preserving context because the protocol requires information from the user that will leak privacy in order to validate the correctness of a function call. For example, the protocol needs to know who the user is, that they're author, like that, that, that they are who they claim they are, um, that the contract that they're transacting with exists, that the, their proof of function execution is correct. All of these things will leak some information. So what we want to do is use recursion to solve this problem. The idea being that uh, the private kernel circuit uh, is um, a zk snark circuit defined at the protocol level, um, uh, where a proof of the kernel circuit effectively represents the proof or a proof of correctness of one function execution. Um, so uh, the the term is um, uh, um, basically is originally in, in the concept of zk snarks. The term is borrowed um, taken from the, the Zexon paper, which is the first paper that described this this kind of um, uh, act of using recursion to verify private function calls. Um, but in, in general software terms, a kernel is a software layer between the user code 
um, and the um, underlying hardware and, and CPU like the silicon. Um, and it enforces the code executions. Um, it, 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 it ensures that uh, basically it's going to do things like um, manage which application is running on the CPU, if you're multitasking, it's going to manage resource access to various applications um, so that uh, multiple applications aren't, um, uh, they're, they're not, they're not kind of um, overwriting each other's memory. Um, and it's the thing that allows, uh, creates a kind of communication boundary to allow cross app communication in a way that um, prevents kind of malicious. Um, uh, interactions between applications, uh, which is what we're doing here with, um, with uh, Snarks. So it's, it's a circuit layer between the user code, uh, for example, like a, a, one of these private contracts, um, and the protocol execution layer. Um, in our case, it's going to be a, an L2 roll-up, but in an abstract way, it doesn't have to be, it could be an L1. Um, so it enforces the, the execution rules um, of the uh, blockchain network. Um, it enforces the, the rules around applying contracts, it manages access to data, it manages access to functions, and it maintains, in our case, privacy of the information. So, we need a private kernel circuit. I think I'm going to have gone over this in a couple of slides previously, but we need to um, be able to authenticate the user without them moving their identity. We want to hide the actual address of the smart contract being called. Uh, we want to ensure that. Um, we have some level of composability and call semantics where functions and core functions of the contracts. Um, and uh, we also want to make sure that we, um, going back to uh, this slide, manage access to data, we also want to make sure that any state changes that a contract is doing, they are effectively, they are only modifying their own state. Like a contract can only modify a state that it's uh, created. Um, uh, I can't write a contract that manipulates the state of another contract. Um, without, like the only way I can do that is by having my contract call the other contract's functions. So then I'm always executing target contract code um, if I want to modify target contract state. So one transaction can contain multiple proofs, um, but we need some way of combining them uh, and, and, and executing them sequentially. Uh, because we don't want to get into a situation where one transaction can only execute one function. Because whilst in theory that can work, in practice that produces a kind of an intolerable developer experience and user experience. Um, because um, what would naturally be one atomic function, like transaction, becomes it split up into multiple, multiple individual function calls and many transactions, and that is painful to manage. Um, and yes, combining function function proofs requires privacy because if, if uh, some of the input parameters are private, then well, what do you do? So to, so to recap at the high level, a private kernel circuit executes the validate, evaluates the correct execution of a single private function call. Uh, the kernel circuit structure is going to be recursive. Um, so the idea is that if you have a large sequence of function calls to make, um, repeatedly constructing kernel circuit proofs will eventually, um, like, uh, eventually you will, you will um, in aggregate, you will, you will be constructing a proof of the correctness of the sequence of execute function calls um, by iteratively computing recursive proofs. Um, you can unwind this recursion into, into a single layer by just having a having a kernel circuit that. So let's say you have your transaction uh, is composed of 10 function calls. You can just have a kernel circuit that if that, that validates the execution of 10 function calls, um, but that will leak information because then if you send that proof to the block to the, to the network, people will be able to see that. Um, your transaction contains 10 function calls. We want to avoid that. Um, so in terms of how this works, the user generates a proof um, that uh, of, a, of the uh, um, of this recursive kernel circuit where uh, the identity of the user is hidden. Um, it's a private input to the kernel circuit. Um, the function arguments, there are 10 values, they are private inputs to the kernel circuits, they're hidden. Um, the state that's being read from is also hidden. You can't hide state rights, um, but you can. But they, they're going to be encrypted, so it's functionally private. Um, and the actual function itself that's being called is also hidden. Uh, and the user is going to submit just one proof that represents the complete, the full execution of the entire private function call stack. Um, for so for each function of call, so um, 
Yes, so, so that's why I mentioned cool semantics a few slides ago. It's because uh, we, we need a cool stack um, to, to, really, to really nail this abstraction and allow for composable privacy. Um, so for each function from the cool stack, we're going to be, um, like what, what, what logic is the kernel circuit going to be executing? Um, we're going to have to validate that, that the user has signed, um, has constructed a digital signature over a transaction um, where the, um, the instruct, like that transaction instruction is going to match the first call in the full stack. And then the idea is that all subsequent calls in the full stack are generated by the output of that first call. Therefore, if you sign a digital signature over that first function call you're making, you are uniquely um, uh, fixing uh, the, uh, um, the execution of your, of your transaction. So, so you don't need to sign over, over, over the um, subsequent calls. Um, the kernel circuit needs to prove that the function that you're executing exists in the function tree, that the contract you're transacting with exists in the contract tree. And by trees here, I mean basically the, um, the contract, the, the, the root of the function tree, the state root of the function tree, uh, sorry, the, 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 the root hash of the function tree, you need to define the contract, and that, and that's, that root hash is going to or is going to exist in, in, in the contract state tree, um, and that we also want to prove that the um, if the function is performing state reads, then the um, the commitments to those um, private state leaks are present in the data tree. Um, this this fourth bullet point, in, technically, it could be done by the um, actual like function circuit itself it doesn't have to be done by the kernel circuit, but it's it's nice if it's done this way because it allows you it it means that um, you have more flexibility to upgrade the hash function um, used to construct the, 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 these data trees. Um, uh, so, for example, uh, let's say um, you want to change your prime fields. Let's say you want to move from local pairs to fry or something, and you, for some reason you want to change your prime fields, you want to upgrade your local pair. Um, then the chances are that the hash function using the hash out for the, for the state root um, for your for your Merkle proofs is going to change. Uh, however, if you're performing all of your state reads and all of your kind of your membership groups inside kernel circuits um, and not user circuits, then you can upgrade the protocol and therefore and change the curve by effectively changing the protocol circuit um, and maintaining backwards compatibility. Uh, it's a bit of a pedantic observation, but um, yes, this full bullet point technically doesn't have to happen in the kind of circuit, again, but it's it's nice for the test. Um, the okay, so moving moving on with what the, what um, what the kernel circuit is going to be doing when executing a function call, um, the kernel circuit will be then examining the public inputs of the function group um, that the user is sending, uh, and it's going to according to the protocol ABI is going to uh, uh, interpret those inputs as instructions to create new commitments, so new UTXOs, create new, new nullifiers, deploy new contracts. It's going to collect those together. Um, uh, and so those instructions are not yet going to be executed. That happens later, um, later on by a third party sequencer, um, because uh, the user cannot actually execute these instructions because that requires um, modifying the state roots of the state tree. And the user does not know the current value of the state tree because that constantly changes. Uh, the kernel cycle then also verify the previous iteration of the kernel group, if, uh, if one exists, um, and um, yeah, and verify the, the proof of the current function being present. Um, there is also one slight abstraction, uh, no, abstraction technical detail here I, I, I'd like to go into, which is um, uh, for folks more. Familiar with these snarks, that this description might have raised some eyebrows because uh, we've said here that the kernel circuit is going to verify the correctness of a previous proof of the kernel circuit. Um, and how do you create a snark circuit that verifies itself? Because to verify a proof, you need it the to verify the proof of a circuit, you need the circuit's verification key. Um, and so, if a, if, a, if a snark circuit is trying to verify itself, its own verification key cannot be part of the circuit description because the verification key is dependent on the circuit description. Um, but the way we get around this is that um, when the kernel circuit is verifying a previous iteration of the kernel 
proof, uh, like a previous kernel proof, uh, the, the actual verification key being used is not fixed by the circuit. It's effectively, it's a public input to the circuit. Uh, and what we do is we perform a consistency check. So um, we don't check that the verification key being used is the kernel circuit verification key. We just check that whatever the key is, it is, it is, equipped, is equal to um, the key that was used at the previous iteration of the kernel circuit. So the idea is that as you're iterating through your kernel proofs, um, at each layer of iteration, the circuit doesn't know what the verification key is, because it's a public input, but it does know that it's the same verification key for each iteration of your circuit. Um, uh, this is useful because then the top level verifier that, that verifies so um, the kernel circuit. So once you once you're out of the recursive um, cycle and you have and your so this will happen in the roll-up circuit, which I'll get into in a bit, but once you're in the roll-up circuit and the roll-up is verifying a kernel proof, it can then check that all of the verification keys used um, in the kernel circuit, in the recursive kernel circuits, um, they all match the kernel circuit verification key. I don't know if that was clear, but uh, you know, uh, feel free to comment um, in the in the, uh, in the in the comments, and I'll, uh, we can we can have a discussion about that. Um, so, what are the inputs going to be for this private kernel kind of, um, circuit? Uh, uh, so, as I said earlier, like we're going to need the the transaction request, um, like a, a digital signature from the user to call the first function in the stack, and check that's correct. Uh, we're going to need the um, the previous um, kind of accumulate like the accumulated data from the previous iterations of the kernel proof, so like all like the uh, um, uh, like the state like all of these. So for example, um, uh, this these new commitments, nullifiers, contracts, etc. Um, uh, and private call data that's relevant to the current function for the process. Um, and yeah, um, something which is it. Hmm. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm missing a diagram here, but um, uh, one of the things that that's, we're going to be doing in this private kernel is you're going to have an input call stack um, that represents the function calls to be executed and an output call stack. Uh, the idea is that the kernel stack it pops one function call to the input call stack, processes it, and then um, uh, copies the input call stack to the output call stack. And if the function will be processed, Emit additional function calls, those function calls will be pushed onto the output stack. And the idea is then you just iteratively um, compute kernel circuit proofs until that private call stack becomes empty. Um, so this is a little diagram of how to come up those recursion. Uh, sorry, it's a little a little distorted. Um, but the idea is proofs are created by the user client side. Um, you start out with that, that signature um, that authorizes it. And the idea is each iteration of the kernel circuit will it'll pull in a proof from a um, from a private from a circuit that represents a function, um, verify its correctness. It'll verify the it'll verify the correctness of the previous iteration of the kernel circuit if we're not kind of at the very start of our recursion cycle, and it'll keep going and going and going and going, going until the your final proof of the kernel circuit has an empty private call stack. This is one of the reasons why we want um, a pretty system where recursion is very cheap, because this has all been done client side. Um, but this abstraction makes it much, much simpler to actually write contracts for this um, kind of architecture, uh, because uh, what it enables is um, like very, very easy convertibility where um, multiple function calls can be uh, combined into a single transaction. Um, so uh, this is some uh, pseudocode for how this may work in terms of actually writing contracts. So uh, this is um, uh, actually sorry I I I I am um, mistaken. This is not pseudocode. This is uh, alpha noir code. Um, so we we have a programming language called noir, um, which compiles uh, high level uh, like a high level Rust programming language to zero knowledge circuits, and we're currently in the process of upgrading noir to support this kind of contract symmetry. Um, but the idea is that we have here um, three contracts. Um, contract one is going to call contract two. Um, function two, uh, contract two on the right is sorry on, on the left. Uh, sorry, let's say let's 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 wind through this transaction that we're trying to do. So we have contract one, 
um, its function one calls two functions in contract two. Um, uh, function two one and two two. Um, doing some simple arithmetic. Function two one calls contract three. <laughs> function three. Um, and then calls its own function two three, which then calls contract three. So the idea is we basically have um, a, um, a somewhat complex sequence of function calls here where contract one is calling contract two, which then calls um, contract three. But then when that function returns, it then calls contract two calls one of its own functions, which then calls contract three again. Um, and then that returns and then returns out, and then that returns down all the way down to contract one. So how is that going to work? Well, when we when we run our first iteration of the pilot kernel circuit, uh, we are going to the, the output of that is going to push two function calls onto the pilot call stack, you know, calls to uh, two two and two one. Um, and the idea is it's it's a feed of queue, so first and first back. Um, uh, when we run the next iteration of the kernel circuit, we're going to pop the call to two two. Um, uh, sorry. Is it first in, first out? I oh, know it's last in, first out. Um, so in the second iteration of the panel circuit, um, we're going to be executing the call to 2, two which is then, you can see this one doesn't have any additional calls, so now the contract, the call stack is wound back down to 2, 1. When we're executing 2, 1, um, this function will call function 3, 1 in, the, in, in contract 3, and it will call function 2, 3. Um, in contract two. But here's where um, I want to introduce this other concept that you may have noticed on the slide, the public calls next. So function two, three here is described as being public, uh, which means that um, it's modifying public state and it is executed, effectively it's going to be executed by a third party sequencer. Um, the proofs of correctness will not be constructed locally. And so the call to two, three gets shoved onto the public call stack. So when we execute two one, we push this call to three one on the private call stack because it's a private call, and we push the call to two three on the public call stack, um, and then we keep going. Um, so um, at the next iteration of the private kernel circuit, we will call function three one, um, and then function three one has no further calls. And so at the end of this private kernel circuit proof, we now have a we're in a state where the private call stack is empty, um, and the public call stack is not empty. At this point, the user's work is done. Um, the the uh, proof of the private kernel circuit at this point is sufficient. Is basically um, uh, um, that that's the finished user transaction, and the user will then send that transaction to a mempool to be picked up by the sequencer. Um, and uh, then things then um, the order of operations is quite similar to what would happen in a in a public um, ZK rollup, where a sequencer is going to um, finish the computation, fin basically finish the, 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 the execution of this transaction by constructing public kernel kind of circuit proofs, um, uh, where uh, one of the rules of the public kernel kind of circuit is that um, the, the input private kernel kind of circuit proof must have an empty uh, private function called that. Um, and then the public kernel kind of circuit will do the same as the private kernel kind of circuit, but just with public function and public state. Um, uh, the reason why this has to happen, like why the user cannot do this has to happen through a third party like a sequencer, is because when you're reading and writing from public state, uh, you need to know the the current um, version of, like you need to know the current state tree of the, um, of the network. Uh, uh, and when the only person who actually knows what that is, is the entity that's constructing the next block, um, the block producer. And so the block producer is going to be composing these calls. Um, and so the public kernel circuit will then, again, it'll, it'll execute function 3.2. Um, yeah, sorry, it'll execute function 2.3, which then calls 3.2, and the public function 3.2 will execute. And then we're, we're, we're effectively, now the transaction is genuinely finished um, and can be processed by a rule up circuit. Um, so yeah, I hope that um, that this is a slightly more visual description of how these call stacks work and why why um, private and public calls are effectively time orders. All the private calls are executed before the public calls, and this in turn is why public function calls cannot return parameters um, because there is no way for 
function two one. If function two one here is calling two three, which is public, um, but you cannot put a, a return parameter here um, because uh, function two three is executed after function two one is executed, not before. Uh, so this is um, a bit more of a, just a bit of a flowchart that tries to describe this all again, but in a, in a slightly different way. Um, so the idea is, again, you have these, these input parameters, like the, the input call specs, the input ETXOs that are going to be, like, the, the state changes that are being requested, um, things like the, the call depth, um, like how, how deep into the stack are you going, uh, and what are called temporary spot record state, which is things like, um, it's state that is um, basically blockchain state. So, so um, the, the timestamp, the block hash, uh, things like that. Um, uh, and this oracle state will be historical, it will be based at, the, the, the user will have the oracle state at what, at what they think is the current version of the, of the chain. Um, and as long as that version is, you know, like, was, was correct at some point in the blockchain's life cycle, uh, that's good enough. Um, the user wants the oracle state um, to be as, um, as recent as possible because that leaks less information. The older it is, um, the the more like the the older your oracle state is, uh, users then can uh, observers can then assume that it means your your, your transaction will be dated. Um, so what do we do? So if the call depth is zero, then um, oh there's there's missing something here. If the call um, yes and no uh, the one on the slide that they got lost somewhere. So if the call depth is is zero. We verify that that ECDSA signature from the message center, um, and if it's if it is if it is not zero, we verify a previous iteration of the kernel proof, and we perform this kind of this consistency check where the output parameters from the previous iteration of the same as the input parameters of the current iteration, and this output track the the previous output parameters are pulled from the public efforts of the kernel proof. Um, but after this operation, uh, everything is the same. Well, we pop a function called the private call stack. We validate the replication key exists, we verify the proof, we get the public inputs from the proof, um, we then update the private call stack if we need to, we update the public call stack if we need to, um, and then we perform the, 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 the uh, state, we, we add to the, to the, the queue that, that describes the status, the state updates that you wish to make, um, and then you, you should have all of this on to the kind of circuit output parameters, which um, confusingly will become public inputs to the circuit. What does the kernel circuit not do? Um, so this is something just, just to clarify a little bit. Um, uh, there are, like, we need to be very careful about what, particularly the private kernel circuit can and cannot do. Uh, because, um, a base, uh, and this is going to be based on the, the information that's available to the prover. Um, so uh, it does not, so when, I say, when we say execute function circuits themselves, what we mean by this is the actual, if you go back to this, um, these, these function circuits, um, their proofs are um, generated kind of outside of the kernel circuits. So the idea is that when a user is going to make their private kernel proofs, they already have the, the proofs for, for all these function circuits like that. Um, uh, it doesn't perform tree insertions. Um, so that's why we have these queues. Um, so we have this, this queue for UTXOs, the nullifiers, because um, we cannot actually insert those into the state trees, uh, because to do that requires um, updating the root of the state tree, which means we need to know the latest value of the state tree root. Um, and then you get race conditions, because then uh, even if the user has enough information to do that, uh, two different users sending transactions to the same block, they cannot both modify the, the roots of the state tree because you get race conditions. So the idea is that the um, the circuit doesn't do the tree insertions; it just emits instructions to perform tree insertions. Um, and then these are these are all done by a roll off circuit that is um, constructed by a a, 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 a sequencer or a block producer um, uh, who has who can basically order transactions and then um, perform all the state updates one by one. And yeah, you can't merge multiple separate transactions signed by separate users. Um, they are aggregated in a, in a roll of circuit, um, which is the roll of circuit effectively um, uh, doing it, doing what um, an Ethereum node does when when a, when a block is being processed. Okay, so um, <laughs> so 
Uh, let's take, take a bit of a pause here. But um, we are, we're almost through, so this is a 50 slide um, uh, lecture. And um, we've, all, we've gone through most of the tricky uh, abstractions so far. I've already briefly mentioned the public cloud circuit, but now I think it's time to dive into it in some more depth. Because uh, this is what we use to verify the correctness of public functions. Um, so just to, just to recap what I mean by a public function, a public function is a function um, in a, like a, that's part of a smart contract that's going to define the rules around um, uh, public data. Uh, so if I have a, like the, the total supply, of, if my contract has a total supply of liquidity pool, or it has some kind of, if, if I'm implementing some kind of ZK game, but there's some shared game state between um, all the players, um, this will be public state, and it's and it will have to be modified in a public function. So yeah, the um, the the initial state of a transaction in the public mempool is going to have to be that it's going to be a proof of the private kernel circuit, but the private kernel circuit will be empty, um, uh, and the public kernel circuit will contain public, public functions to be executed. Uh, the public functions are then validated by a public kernel circuit, which is um, its structure is, exception, is very, very similar to the private kernel circuit. The main differences really are who executes it um, and therefore the information available to the kernel circuit. So at this point, for example, the, the transaction center is hidden. Um, uh, you, you, know, you know that somebody wants to execute a, a sequence of public function calls, but you don't necessarily know who they are. Um, and these proofs are going to be generated. Well, so, so what happens here is a sequencer is going to um, order transactions, so they're going to be grabbing out these, these grabbing the private kernel proofs from the mempool, ordering them in a block, um, computing the, 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 the witness assignments to them, um, so basically performing all the state updates. But, it's, but the sequencer is then going to um, delegate the actual computation of these zero proofs to provers. Um, the idea being that um, the sequencer has relatively low computational resources required. Um, uh, and the prover has relatively high competition resources. Um, we'd like to perform this separation. Um, this is something which a lot of DKL2s are doing uh, because the secret server is, the en is an entity that is um, more trusted than a prover. Uh, so a sequencer cannot um, cannot manipulate transactions, uh, but they, they do order the transactions. Um, and so they can choose to um, emit, like to not include transactions in, in the pool. Um, they can choose to, to order them in a certain way, particularly if that, given there are public functions involved, then you have this issue of minor acceptable value, uh, which can, which in this case will be expected by the sequencer. So there's more respect for the sequencer, so the, you need stronger kind of economic incentive mechanisms to ensure the sequencer acts honestly through things like proof of stake, whereas the provers are relatively untrusted and um, more straightforward. The idea is that um, they are instructed to make a proof of correctness of a, of a of a transaction, and so they can only do one of two things: they can construct a valid proof or an invalid proof, and they only get paid for valid proof. Um, we also care about the sequence approver separation because the idea is that whilst you may have one sequence server that's producing a given block, you may that you may want to have a, a large distributed network of provers making the proof, um, given the computational complexity. So um, that aside out of the way, uh, how does one compute proofs of public functions? Um, uh, so yeah, it's done by a third party with a public kernel circuit. Um, the, the, yes, the, the, you, you get into economic complications now because um, you're getting a third party to um, to construct these proofs, and therefore you need to make sure they're fairly compensated for the work they perform. Uh, and that is uh, yes, um, this this changes a little bit. Um, so let's, let's wind, wind it back a bit. Um, you have a trust problem between the users and the sequences because if you go back to, if you think, if we cast our mind back to the uh, private kernel circuit and the private functions, um, the way I described them was that uh, private functions are going to be defined as some kind of fireable programming language like Noir. They get compiled onto zk circuits, and um, so a contract's public function that is represented by smart verification keys. Um, the idea here being that um, uh, if the private function call is valid, the user will be able to generate a valid proof of that function call. Um, 
what this has glossed over is that there are there, there are actually two ways that a function proof can be mapped. One of them is that um, the public inputs chosen to, um, produces unsatisfiable constraints. So this is this is what will happen if your function like has an assertion of the inference error. So if you, if you think about an Ethereum smart contract, um, if you, in an ERC twenty contract, if I try to transfer tokens that I do not own, let's say I, I, let's say I own ten tokens and I try to transfer a thousand, then there will be an assertion of error, and that transaction will be invalid. That's what case number one um, is in this case. Uh, the second scenario, though, is that the witness assignment is deliberately bad. So you imagine a case where the prover, the public inputs that the prover has chosen are good, as in, for an honest prover, you will be able to create satisfiable constraints and create that. However, the prover is dishonest and deliberately assigns what is valid um, to the circuit that are, that are invalid. Um, we can rule out case two for private functions because a user will be sabotaging themselves if they did this. However, for public functions, things are more complicated because the first failure case will be caused by the transaction sender giving, you know, um, transaction inputs that will throw. And the second failure is caused, would be caused by the sequencer or, or the prover. Um, and for the future sites here, I'm going to use sequencer as a, as a um, um, prover synonymously because they are, they're doing, they, they, they have some response, they're, they're basically doing, it's one role that's being shared across two, two actors. So for simplicity, I'm just going to refer to them sequencer from now on. Um, but yeah, if the sequencer just puts invalid witness assignments, then they can make a what would be a good transaction fail. And we have to be able to distinguish between these two. Um, so yeah, um, um, we're going to get to the end of it. But basically, uh, if we just took the private kernel circuit architecture and made it the public kernel circuit architecture, we would it open up potential briefing attacks. Um, because a sequencer could brief a prover, a, a transaction sender, a user, by taking a, like the user sent them a valid transaction, but they could fiddle with the witness assignment to make that transaction for it. Um, and in doing so, um, uh, waste um, the user's time and probably some of their money as well. Uh, however, you, you also run into the other problem whether you use a brief um, a sequencer, uh, because they can. Um, uh, they can create, um, imagine the user can create like a nested sequence of very, very complicated function calls, which eventually will end in a transaction um, throwing and creating an invalid proof. Uh, if, the, if the sequencer is only paid for valid proofs being pressed in the block, uh, then um, this is effectively a briefing attack because the sequencer will have to simulate the transaction uh, uh, up to the point where it fails. Um, and that would all be work that they would not be compensated for or paid for. Um, and so you could launch a DDoS attack using that. Um, so yeah, basically you, you want to make sure you want to rule, you want to ensure with the public functions of two key characteristics. One, users can't brief sequences. As in users, if a sequencer is doing work on behalf of the user, the user has like they're they're fairly compensated by the user paying them. Uh, two, you want to ensure that. Um, sequences must act faithfully. So, uh, if a user has provided um, a you know private kernel proof, um, that represents a valid transaction where the, where the public functions are all going to would normally honestly be correctly executed. The sequencer should not have any ability to make that transaction fail. Um, and this is why public functions require a virtual machine. Um, the idea here is by virtual machine, what we mean is that instead of converting a program directly into a ZK circuit. You convert your program into virtual machine opcodes, and then you have a ZK circuit that evaluates the sequence of the end codes. You need this, um, this abstraction there because now you can distinguish between these two failure cases before. Basically, if the transaction fails because it throws an error, then the VM proof will still succeed. It's just that the output of the VM proof will be uh, zero instead of one to represent that the transaction fail. Um, uh, this is extremely useful because it means now that at the protocol level, say in the roll-up circuit, uh, you can, when, um, or sorry, in the, in the public kernel circuit, when the public kernel circuit is verifying a public function, it will be verifying a proof of the virtual machine. And it, the 
the, the public kernel circuit can require that proof to be valid uh, without disadvantaging the sequencer or the user. Um, they can require that proof to be valid because the only way it's invalid is if the sequencer is not doing their job. Um, because the user, no matter what inputs the user provides to the VM circuit, the VM proof will always be valid in, in, under, under an honest proof of assumption. It's just that the output of the um, like the public inputs to the VM circuit may describe a penny transaction. Um, uh, similarly, uh, so it means that basically the sequencer cannot do like tamper with the witness assignments um, and disadvantage the user because if they tamper with the witness assignments, the VM proof will fail, and therefore the public function, uh, the public kernel circuit will um, fail, and failing public kernel proofs can be included in the blocks, and therefore the sequencer has done a bunch of work that's not going to be included in the block. Um, so they're only hazard themselves. Um, so, yeah, basically the user cannot force the sequence to do opaque work because if they have some complicated transaction that results in a failure, well, um, the, the VM proof is still valid. And so you can you can ensure, you can you can create mechanisms to ensure that the user is um, will, will have fairly paid for that work um, by effectively using gas metering, where before the sequence uh, constructs the VM proof, the kernel circuit effectively is validated that the, the user has performed a transfer of funds um, equivalent to some volume of gas, uh, and then you perform gas metering um, uh, in, inside your virtual machine to make sure that um, the sequence, uh, any, any computation the sequence is doing uh, has been fairly compensated for. Um, so yes, virtual machines. Uh, okay, so let's go through briefly how virtual machines work. This is a slight aside, um, but I figured it's worth discussing in, in some detail if a privacy preserving smart contract architecture encoded as a ZK a roll up requires um, a hybrid state, uh, then to handle public state, you need a virtual machine. Um, so in a regular um, CPU context, um, uh, um, how does a CPU architecture work? Because uh, oddly enough, um, when building uh, SNARK circuits, the, there, are, there are some interesting parallels here. Uh, first of all, you're going to have some kind of opcode. Um, so on the right here, we um, I, this is just a description of the um, 6502 processor. It's one of the very first um, early microcomputers uh, and just a block diagram about how it works. And some of these structures are going to, we are going to duplicate inside a SNARK circuit that encodes an abstract virtual machine. Um, uh, to start with, your, you have your um, instruction set, which is defined as a sequence of opcodes, where from the um, the program writer's perspective, each opcode is going to be an atomic operation. However, for um, most CPUs, both past and present, um, if you look at the kind of the list of assembly opcodes that are available, your CPU process is not going to uh, compute those opcodes in a single CPU cycle. What's actually going to happen is that that opcode is split into um, several microcode operations. And these microcode operations um, are atomic. Um, they can be performed by the CPU um, once per clock cycle, uh, but they're generally much more primitive than um, a high-level operation like adding two numbers together and storing the result in memory. A microcode operation may be um, executing the arithmetic logic unit, or maybe like loading a va some value from memory, store like storing a value from memory, but not um, each microcode on, on its own doesn't do a ton of useful work. Um, the uh, in a, in a CPU architecture, you, your data is oops, stored in registers. Um, so for the 6502, you just have two two registers, really the X and the Y register. Um, uh, any 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 um, remaining data that your program needs to access is going to be offloaded to some random access memory, um, uh, which is not part of the CPU itself. Um, and arithmetic instructions are processed by an arithmetic logic unit. The reason why I bring this up is because um, writing SNARK VMs um, is, is quite similar. So um, so what I'm describing here is, is how to um, encode virtual machines inside SNARK circuits. Um, it differs slightly for Starks, um, but I think the, the, the general process is going to be similar. But this, what I'm describing here is how to do it using a Plonkish style arithmetization, um, where each um, column here represents a effectively a wire and a gate. So the, thing, the first thing you can realize, see, see here, is that um, if you're creating a VM circuit, your gates are very wide. You have many, many wires going into the gates. Uh, so we have uh, runtime columns committed by 
two by the prover. Um, so these are effectively, these are columns where the, the cell values are going to be um, part of the witness statement. They're going to be determined not by the circuit instance, but by, by the um, uh, at runtime. Uh, you then have um, these, this memory table, which is going to be encoded as a, as a runtime lookup table. And what I mean by this is it's, it's a lookup table where the values are not pre-computed. Um, you can think of it as a, just a key value lookup, but the, um, the, the initial initialization of the table is going to be um, committed to by the prover. So these blue columns are also part of the witness statement. Um, and then you have a program specific lookup table uh, where this is going to be, um, these, these column values will be dependent on the actual VM program being executed because they represent the sequence of VM opcodes. Um, and then the, the green columns are genuinely pre-computed lookup tables. So these are lookup tables which basically describe for a given opcode what, uh, what are going to be the um, selector values that are going to be applied to um, each, uh, e each constraint. Uh, and so this differs slightly from a, from a regular Planck-style arithmetization. So in, in, regular, in a, in a, in a Planck-style system, uh, you, have your, um, your, you have a set of pre-computed selector polynomials uh, that are part of the circuit instance, and then you have your witness commitments, which are, which are wire assignments to your gates. Um, and then you, you, use, you create some kind of algebra, al some, some algebraic statement involving the selector polynomial, like this, the selector values and the, and the y values. Uh, for a virtual machine, um, what happens is you have a, uh, you don't know what, like the, um, the, the circuit, the, the conditions that you're applying, the arithmetic conditions you're applying at each row of your circuit uh, are not necessarily known ahead of time because they depend on the opcode that's being processed. Uh, and so the way, the way that these VM architectures work is that you actually have a commitment to your program counter and your and the, and the opcode um, that you're processing in a given row, and what's going to happen here is that the program counter is going to index uh, the lookup table, um, the the opcode lookup table that describes your VM program, and the what you're going to then read out of the lookup table is these two values t op um, slight formatting issue um, and basically you're going to look up the opcode that um, value and the microcode value that corresponds to a specific value of the program counter. Um, the idea is literally the program counter is literally just a, an index into like which opcode op in your program list you're working on. Um, the reason I split things up into opcode and microcode is because how we are going to arch how we architect VMs in snark context is that uh, each row of your VM circuit evaluates one microcode uh, operation. Um, so for example, if you want to have a SHA-256 opcode, you can't evaluate an entire SHA-256 hash in a single row in a circuit unless you have you know, thousands of columns, which is not efficient. Uh, and so what we will then do is um, split the SHA-256 opcode into possibly several hundred um, independent microcode operations where each, each unique combination of opcode microcode value will map to um, unique selector lookups that then get converted into, that then um, get transformed into get selectors. So the idea here is that uh, your program counter defines the values of op your opcode and your microcode for a current row, uh, and your values of opcode and microcode um, index the selector lookup table to pull out the select gate selectors you're applying to that row. And then those gate selectors are going to define the transition rules for how you transition from the current row to the next row. And basically, what, how do the registers values change? How does the memory table value change if you're doing memory, memory accesses? And also how the program counter value changes. Um, so to give an example here, well, I, I, um, so I'm getting ahead of myself. So uh, this is just a summary of what I was just describing. You, um, the opcode microcode values are read from the opcode lookup table. Gate selectors are read from the selector lookup table. And then the values of your, the, 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 the values of the registers and um, your program counter at the next row um, are dependent on the gate selectors. There's going to be some kind of VM algebraic statement that you're going to be applying. Uh, that will depend on the VM architecture. Um, but so to give an example here, um, I've got some like examples of uh, an, an abstract, an arbitrary, an, some random imaginary VM and some potential opcodes for this, where if you have an opcode, the idea is that uh, this is just um, saying that the, the first, uh, the, like the first register, R1 here, that'll be this value at the next row is going to be equal to just the sum of two registers. That's just, um, that's going to be some, just some algebraic statement here. Um, uh, 
you can have a move up code there where you're actually doing a memory lookup. Um, so the value of the the value in the first register is being indexed, is indexing a memory table. Uh, that and the value is being set to the set to the value of the first register of the next row. Um, so you would use some kind of lookup or plookup protocol for this. Um, and then similarly for like inclusive or you're doing uh, this would be saying you're, you're this is one variant of an XOR where you're 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 using saying R one is the exclusive OR of its value and um, the look, the memory lookup of R two. Uh, you may want this. So I've said here as an example, this would use one microcode operation. You may need you, you may need more um, because you may need, need a microcode operation to do the memory access and then um, a microcode operation to do the exclusive OR. And then as an example, I've said SHA two by six here. You could say that you're going to store <laughs> in uh, the memory cell pointed to by R one. Um, uh, the SHA two by six value of the memory cell um, pointed to by R two, and this would require many many um, custom uh, like special specialized gates with specialized selectors. Uh, and then finally, you can have things like conditional jump instructions, and this is one of the reasons why VMs are so powerful. Other than so, I, I explained earlier that we need virtual machines so that you can so a sequencer can can definitively say that they have proved they have correctly executed a um, a user's public function program, even if that program um, throws an error. But there's another reason why you may want to use a VM architecture instead of just directly compiling a program to constraints. And that's because conditional jump instructions are possible in a VM, branching programs. Because what you what you, you do basically is just you say that um, the value of the program counter at the next row is dependent on whether a register value is zero or not. So either it normally advances by one, as you would normally do, or you could say you assign it uh, some specialized constant value x, where x would point to another um, location in the in the program table. Uh, so um, VMs have their pros and cons. Um, pros, pros are you can you know you can prove that you've run a program even if that program throws an error. Uh, you can do conditional branching very very easily, whereas in a in a regular snark circuit, if you're just compiling a program to constraints. Um, Typically, the way you do branching paths is you have to evaluate in your circuit both branches. However, the cons are that VM circuits are much more expensive to prove. Um, so this example architecture I've, I've given, uh, one of the big differences between this and a regular Plonkish style circuit is that uh, these, these selector polynomials that, you're being, that, are being, that are defining the algebraic relationships that are being applied on each row, these are now part of the witness statement. Um, because you have to look them up at each row. They're, like you're, you're getting these from a lookup table that is being indexed by by a not code or microcode value. So, what in a in a regular Plonk circuit, what is not what is part of a part of the circuit instance and is pre-computed is now part of the witness commitment, and that greatly slows down proving times. Um, just similarly, just the sheer number of rows you need, uh, columns you need to perform basic operations, it's very expensive. Um, you do no you no longer get copy constraints for free uh, because effectively your 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 um, your memory state has to be represented by some kind of lookup table because you're um, uh, you don't know what the why, like which wires you need to index at a given row because um, what you're doing at a given row is defined by an uh, the, uh, the opcode value which is dependent on um, the witness statement. <laughs> so uh, so you have to commit to a lot more information in a VM. Uh, this is why we don't use VMs for evaluating private functions uh, in this proposed architecture. Because um, we want these, the, the a proof of the correct execution of a private function is going to be computer client side, uh, in in restricted hardware. Uh, so we want to make this proof as, as efficient as possible, and therefore we will we compile our private function programs directly down into uh, snark circuits. We only use the VM architecture for public functions because we have to, um, because we need to verify, because we need this. We have the condition where. I mean, the sequencer needs to be able to prove they've correctly executed the program, even if the program fails. So you, you want to you want to separate out the concept of the program failing and the snark proof being invalid. Uh, and also, our sequencers have much higher computational resources than client side provers because a sequencer is some third party that can be running computationally heavy hardware. So proving times are less less important. So just to summarize where we've where we've reached so far, we have. Um, described how like uh, the general abstractions for constructing um, uh, like how, what like what does a private smart contract mean um, you know the concepts of a private state machine why you need hybrid public and private state uh, to create um, uh, kind of a composable 
privacy, privacy preserving smart contracts, and then how you um, can process, um, have some kind of concept of core semantics and, fun and un understanding of composable transactions by representing your program as private functions, public functions, and then using these kernel circuits to evaluate um, sequences of function calls. So we're at a stage where if you consider this the life cycle of a transaction, a user has generated a private kernel proof that proves the correctness of the private function calls. That gets, gets submitted to some sequencer, which who then computes the um, public kernel circuit proofs required to execute the public function calls. And so um, a completed transaction will be a proof of a public kernel circuit where both the private function call stack and the public function call stack are empty. Uh, this is where we hand off to a roll-up circuit. Uh, so why does this kind of architecture need a roll-up circuit? Um, you, verifying a block of transactions in a privacy-preserving network is very expensive because each transaction is a, um, is a snark proof and verifying snark circuit, snarks is relatively expensive. So it's like, uh, ideal if the, if, if the consensus layer needs, only needs to do a very minimal amount of execution and verify one proof of correctness for an entire block of transactions. Uh, so this is a diagram that describes the, the uh, base roll-up circuit. Um, so the idea here is that what a roll-up circuit is doing is it's, it's aggregating uh, user transaction proofs. It's, it's aggregating, aggregating public kernel proofs. Um, now, one could architect this in a way where the um, you have one roll-up circuit that verifies a very large number of kernel circuit proofs, but this is um, this has some issues because it means that the the computational resources of that prover needs to be very large because um, recursing thousands of times is expensive, and we want to avoid um, uh, basically uh, we want to avoid infrastructure centralization, as in your distributed ledger is going to be um, more more uh, more decentralized and permissionless if the number of people you can actually participate as roll-up providers as provers is is very large um, which means you want to minimize the amount of hardware required um, you also it also um, you want to make this pro this prover process as parallelizable as possible and so what we are doing here in the space roll-up circuit is we are only aggregating two proofs we take two public kernel proofs we run them through an aggregation circuit um, to, to, con to compress them down into a single proof. Uh, and similarly, what we're doing here is we're taking the, um, uh, the state changes. Um, so this is basically your, the nullifiers that are being added to the state tree, the commitments and the set of um, kind of public data tree changes. Uh, and we're um, combining them um, and performing the, the Merkle insertion proofs to, to update the state. Uh, and so we, we also have a condition here, obviously, where these state updates need to be plausible. Um, so if nullifiers are being inserted to the nullifier set, this is where we check those nullifiers do not already exist. If if data is being modified in the public data tree, we, we validate that the kind of the, the old state, like the 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 imp, like the um, the original state claim is correct before we modify it. We, we change that state variable to it to the new data claim. And similarly, when you're adding commitments to the tree, we verify those commitments do not already exist. Um, and then finally, we, we hash this all down into a hash of the public inputs. Um, the idea is then we have a merge circuit. Uh, so the merge roll-up circuit is a, um, it takes two proofs, um, it takes two base roll-up proofs and combines them, again, into a single proof. Um, and similarly, it combines the, the public inputs into a single public input. The reason why we're doing this is because we don't want the number of public inputs to grow as we combine proofs, because um, if we ensure that the proof, the, the number of um, public, if the number of outputs kind of public inputs is always one, uh, then it allows us to use a circuit in a recursive fashion. So you can use this, the merge roll-up circuit. Um, uh, so to, to combine um, uh, base roll-up circuit proofs, uh, but then you can use a, ah, yeah, this, this explains it better. Um, so the idea is that uh, we have um, the base roll-up circuit will, will aggregate two proofs. The merge roll-up circuit will aggregate one of either two base roll-up proofs or two merge roll-up proofs. And then you can basically recursively iterate on your merge roll-up um, circuit to, com to, to aggregate um, a very, very large number of transaction proofs into one by 
by just um, uh, increasing the number of layers of this uh, tree. So small cycle sizes, fast proofs. Uh, this also massively improves parallelizability because each uh, at each layer of the tree, each of these independent proofs can be constructed by um, independent hardware. There's no no real data sharing between these 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 blobs, uh, and um, that massive parallelization is very useful in a decentralized network because it means fundamentally, if you if proving time is your uh, bottleneck, then the um, the overall amount of proof, like the amount of time it takes to construct a proof, assuming you have an arbitrary amount of parallel compute available, it's going to scale with the log of your block size, which therefore means uh, the larger your blocks, uh, the more the greater your transaction throughput in the system. Uh, we have one final layer before we want to... So in our case, what we're doing in this architect, proposed architecture is we are um, going to be sending the final proof of correctness of the block proof um, to a, a consensus layer to be verified and executed. Uh, and so if we're using um, a consensus like a layer like Ethereum, we want the, veri the, the final top-level verifier to be as... Um, uh, cheap as possible, as in we want the, the verify algorithm to be as, as um, small as possible uh, so that the um, computational costs to the to the smart contract on Ethereum is very low and therefore the gas costs for processing that volume are very low. And so we use a concept of proof devolution because um, for all of these proofs I've been describing so far, the user proofs, the kernel cycle proofs, the roll-up roll proofs, the merge roll-up proofs, we want to use the fastest prover that we have that um, available to us, uh, even if the verifier is, is not necessarily um, the most efficient uh, because the only thing we care about is prover time. We don't really care about prover size that much because the proof size keeps get, gets um, swallowed by, by all of these proofs. Uh, however, we then have one layer of recursion, final layer of recursion here, where we devolve proof systems um, to more primitive proving systems with cheap, small, lower, lower verifier overheads. So for example, if we'll be using the honk proving system, um, as our main prover, which is basically it's it's a Planck style arithmetization, but using some protocols, that's a relatively high verifier cost. Um, so uh, what one can do there is use some um, something like an ultra Planck circuit uh, to verify honk proof, and then use a regular Planck circuit to verify an ultra Planck proof. Um, the reason why you'd want to do this is because uh, at each step you're using a proving system that's more um, you could say primitive, as in the prover is slower, uh, and so. To, to construct, to verify a full honk proof in a standard long circuit would be extremely expensive um, in terms of prover times. Um, but, and so the overall prover time is, is faster if you do this, if you do an intermediate step where you go from honk to ultra plonk to standard plonk. And then finally, you get your final output proof, um, which is just a regular standard plonk circuit, which is very cheap to verify on chain. Um, you can go one layer further and use um, flonk. It's a, a fast Fourier flonk, uh, a plot plonk. It's, um, uh, Polygon Zero, we're using it for those EKVM. It's it's the most um, verifier efficient form of Planck, but it comes at the cost of a very slow prover. So yeah, let's um. So to kind of summarize where we are with this all, um, uh, so let's kind of. Uh, I know this has been a relatively long uh, lecture of over fifty slides, um, uh, but the the goal of this has been to describe a, how to create a privacy preserving smart contract architecture, how to encode that as a set of snark circuits um, and then how those snark circuits are kind of um, combined together to, to um, uh, allow for private privacy preserving transactions to be processed and how that you can then you can use a consensus layer like Ethereum to validate the correctness of um, transaction blocks that are going through this network. Um, so to start with, uh, to, to recap kind of the, the data structures that are represented in this layer two, we're going to have a, a state tree for private state um, we're going to have a state tree for public state and a state tree for contract state. Uh, the the public state is going to be um, uh, a account based Merkle Patricia tree. The private state is a append only uh, Merkle tree. The nullifier set we have one nullifier set for a private state because that's how we re we mark private UTXOs as being deleted, um, so that for to an observer you cannot. Um, cannot link a nullifier to um, an element of the state tree. So therefore, when an observer sees a nullifier being created, they have no knowledge about which UTXO has actually been deleted. You need the decryption key for that. 
and a, and, a, and a smart contract in this paradigm is defined as a set of verification keys um, for a the set of private and public functions that compose a contract. We're going to use a private kernel circuit to validate the correctness of a single private function um, call uh, and perform the various uh, consistency checks for the that make sure that the transaction has conforming to the rules of the protocol. We will then use recursion, uh, a recursive structure of the kernel circuit such that um, uh, to enable a sequence of function calls uh, to be composed inside a transaction because private function calls may pop push um, additional function calls onto a function call stack and the private kernel circuit will uh, pop one function call off the private call stack, execute it, push any output calls onto the call stacks uh, and then you will recursively, the user will recursively construct private kernel circuit proofs until their function call stack, their private function call stack is empty. You then have a similar structure for a for your public kernel circuit, which does the same but as the private kernel circuit, but it, it presses the public function call stack um, and verifies the correctness of the original private kernel proof. You then have a roll-up circuit that verifies the public kernel proof and performs all of the required state updates, because up till, until this point, no state updates have been performed, as in no Merkle tree roots have been modified. All that's happened is that these kernel circuits are spitting out state update instructions that a roll-up circuit needs to process. And then finally, you have a root roll-up circuit, which uh, you verifies the roll-up proof using a, a, a SNARK protocol with, with very low verification costs, but probably very high proof costs. So that's it, really. Um, I'd like to thank several people. Uh, uh, um, there's obviously the, the ZK MOOC organizers. Um, and thank you, Dawn, for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I'd also like to thank several people from Aztec who have um, helped with these slides immensely. Um, I have, uh, um, so yes, the, these slides have been a, a very collaborative effort from uh, David, Sayash, Michael, um, and thank, special thanks to Genevieve and, and Joseph uh, for helping me um, organize this all. So yeah, that's that's everything from me. Uh, I believe that there is going to be a Q&A session in the comments of this um, comment section for this video, and uh, I will be yes watching the comments um, and answering any questions folks have. Thank you very much.